Well, I guess I'd, I'd start off with the idea of a, a, a settler society country, which isn't all that old. What what would be the future of of a country like this, a modern a modern Australia, and what would Aboriginal people think about this, uh, and what do they think about this? Actually, I guess they'd they'd think about uh, as as they've been saying for for the last two hundred years or so is is to learn about the land, learn about the uh, the concept of uh, a law of obligation. Um, of looking after the land, and that's actually the kind of society then you um, will end up with um, if it's a template for society. So it starts off with relationality, relationalism, and survivalism. It's like a it's a choice, but it's not a choice between either or, so to speak, but relationalism and survivalism are bound up with each other from an Aboriginal point of view. Um, so the people that originally came here, the whitefellas, it was definitely a survivalist kind of um, notion. Um, um, what one white historian called, um, it was like a, treated like a gulag, uh, Australia, the big continent of Australia, uh, to, um, as a, place for the um, unwanted, basically. So starting off, two, you know, 200 years later um, and talking about what can be made of this situation. So from, from our point of view, it would be to establish uh, for a long time and properly a relationship with land because that's the most important. Two relationships, one with land and one, one between people. The one between people is contingent or depends on the one between land and people and so on. So then we, we get to this, um, what Aboriginal people ended up with in their in their long, long development, social and political development, is, is uh, one of um, a custodial ethic of looking after land and that becomes a core meaning of what kind of society you have then. It becomes the template. So the big one is the law of obligation. You're obliged to look after land because land invented us. It's the true inventor. And all these intermediary kind of spiritual ancestors or an ancestors, um, the dreaming and, and so on. So spiritual ancestors, um, ancestral spirits and so on, they help us in different parts of the country because the country is different from place to place. They have ways teachings, I suppose, of how to look after the land, what to do, and, and so on. It's as if, if I can quote something, um, uh, a foundational principle, to the extent that the land is the source of the law, and law meaning a huge construct, including philosophy and worldviews and, and so on, to the extent that the land is the source of the law, Aboriginal people, Aboriginal Australia seem to say to the people, us, Aboriginal people, cooperate, don't compete, share, don't hoard, attend the consensus, meaning meetings, extend your relationships, look after land and honour your sacred sites. It's a law which requires a, an ahistorical view of time, so it's forever. It's a kind of forever. No matter what kind of changes happen, that is via, mainly via technology and so on, so you, what you would end up with then is a, a sacralised uh, ecological stewardship system. You're aiming for that kind of um, life for, for everybody, actually. There's an older saying, Aboriginal people have a look after country and look after kin, actually. So look after the country and, and look after people. So country always becomes first because... It's like um, you're saying um, that the humans uh, need some kind of um, preface or uh, experience beforehand, before um, learning what um, you know ethics are, principled living, and and so on. What kind of a society you have? You've got to have something there. So you practice looking after land. Practice. Um, bring kids up and so on and so on in that way. That's why we always fought for land rights, not civil rights. So and after a while, um, 
you are you have um, embedded in you uh, uh, an ethical life. For example, um, again, if I could quote something, um, the concept of the law of obligation is because the land brought us into being, continues to keep us alive and protected, we're forever obliged to look after it. But more than a duty, it's brought us into the the sacred rash, relational, the embedding of ethics, morality, empathy in us. In other words, acquiring the condition of being worthy of what is proper, actually. So, so stewardship, in the modern term too, stewardship is supposed to be like this, of looking after everybody, but principally looking after land first because we don't know how to look after everybody without this example of looking after land and so on. The other, uh, there are a whole range of um, laws, if you like, of obligation. It, it attends to absolutely everything. Um, the custodial ethic, which is the looking after, looking after country and looking after kin. All the things you're quite aware of, every human uh, group, uh, uh, culture is aware of this. Reciprocity, autonomy, ethics, place. Place is extremely important. Um, uh, importance of primacy, actually, of, of family, children, uh, young, old people. Um, balance, uh, that is gender balance. So women run things equally, but in balance, I prefer the word in balance. Um, with men, um, that's that's why you, you have things like men's law and women's law, men's business, women's business. It is actually a, um, not just a, a good idea um, and fairness to women or something like that. It's actually about um, uh, governance, actually. That's the way to run a society. So men and women um, in this balanced sort of way. Non-hierarchical. Um, political theory says um, uh, that if you don't have hierarchies, then it must be anarchic. And Aboriginal society really is, a, uh, I reckon, a wonderful example of how that's not true, <laughs> actually. Uh, it's non-hierarchical, or if you want to say it's a soft hierarchy, where older people have um, authority. Uh, very knowledgeable people, I should say, have authority. Positive group dynamics, consensus decision making, um, not not uh, voting, not um, uh, not elections or anything like that. What it actually, what the kind of society it is, it's a, a society of great age, and what they've learned is to have a, a civilizational culture, not a civilizational state. So no idea of a state that is with a small s, you know, a state where powerful forces, powerful um, self-interested forces keep control of society. You, you don't have that. You have a, a civilizational culture which has embedded this particular worldview, a Weltanschauung, I call it. It's not a philosophy. It's a, it's a worldview. Um, they've embedded that based on this idea of looking after something outside of the self the, the, not just the personal self, but the social self outside of the self. You have to look after something at a distance, um, which in a sense is like land itself and so on. It's lasted for a very long time, but that's not a virtue in itself, of course. Um, it's what, what has been developed over this long, long period of time. And uh, so it's a, a flat society, flat, not hierarchical. It's... Um, it's huge. The whole of Europe, I think, could fit into um, into this country. And one of the biggest, uh, uh, I think, my most unique thing about it is that there's no such uh, concept like invasion. You could, you, they, they handled uh, in a balanced way the whole problem of violence too, um, conflict and violence. And um, so you could have fighting. Um, you could have fighting like on the land, but not over land. You couldn't fight over land. So in other words, you couldn't have invasion. Um, uh, there's no, it, it seems as if in languages, there's no concept of the idea of invasion. Um, 
invade, like invade, uh, conquest, subjugate, no, nothing like that. So people have been in their place for that long and all kinds of skills go went into it. Um, all, uh, all kinds of ideas um, about how to get on with each other, diplomatic traditions, all the things that most other cultures uh, attempt and have skills at and so on. But um, the idea of um, not fighting over your uh, over your land, not fighting over um, resources and so on, um, was simply not allowed. You collaborate with each other on looking after resources. That's a, that's a big thing too. The idea of this um, stewardship, law of obligation, stewardship and so on, um, the idea is that what you would end up with and what we did end up with actually um, is the idea of um, uh, land, uh, nourishment, um, health, a flourishing society, security, it's very important security, protocols, a whole lot of things like that, uh, rituals, ceremonies and so on. But the most important thing is a, is guarantees a kind of well-being assurance for future generations. They've got to come into a land or country or a society where it's not threatening, it's um, and they learn in an easy way uh, the idea of uh, an ethical society. You know, so don't think it's a kind of all aiming at a virtuous sort of. Um, society or anything like that. It, essentially, it's efficient, it's, a rash, it's rational, it's sustainable, all the good things, uh, all the goods, if you like, social goods. It's, it's if people could only get uh, exactly in the words of a, another elder, actually, he said, <laughs> trying to explain it to young scientists who are visiting his, his country, um, he said, look, just look after the land and everything else will become clear. <laughs> he said, he said the whole answer to everything is is in looking after land. So so it's the connection between stewardship, um, land stewardship, and the law of obligation, or rather laws of obligation. So you it's like as if um, it's like as if Aboriginal thinking said that. Well, it's very hard to learn how to be um, uh, an ethical person, except through lessons, you know what I mean? Lessons from a wise elder, you know, your own family member, or a grandfather or so, or uh, from books, from ideals, holding up ideals up here uh, and so on. But the, the best way of learning is to actually doing. So ethics is a doing thing, so do it. <laughs> so, so practice of looking after land and then it's born then it's it's uh, embedded inside people in their you know inside psychologically and all that and in fact it becomes a habit you you become ethics becomes a habit that is principled living i should say it still doesn't even though you know still doesn't make um people uh perfect but that's the um that's the idea that there's no notion of perfectibility in this. You are not trying to become very good and virtuous in order to get some reward later on. No, you're doing it to have an efficient country, actually, an efficient society, I should say. That's that's really what it's about. Um, so uh, the law of obligation, and the best thing about it is the law of obligation can be um, transferred to other things. Like, for example, um, because some people get the wrong idea that oh, it's really hard. Well, it's not actually because some societies and old cultures already have done this. And one of the most recent in Murray terms, um, Aboriginal terms, uh, is the, the National Health Service. If we were looking at, uh, for examples of um, the law of obligation, we'd say, ah, tell me about this, this National Health Service. It's a brilliant idea. You know, it looks after everybody. There are no insiders and outsiders. It's free, above all, for all people. And it's very high quality health care for everyone. If someone wants extra, well, they have to pay for it. But there's no um, hierarchy except in the administrative of it and so on. 
So that's a law of obligation from our point of view. So, um, other things like building little um, little bridges, nature bridges or tunnels to stop roadkill, <laughs> looking after all the furry beasties and so on and so on, uh, that's a law of obligation. Anything that looks after the great majority of people and, of course, all of land, la- land, um, and it doesn't necessarily mean because Aboriginal people have, um, you know, negotiated um, things about um, la- land um, exploration, mining and things, although we've usually come off at the worst end of it, you know, <laughs> Aboriginal people, unfortunately. Um, so it can be a whole range of things from looking after sacred sites, of course, naturally, all sacred sites, this is actually, everybody's cultural sacred sites, um, <laughs> to looking after uh, land itself, but social uh, social welfare stuff, you know what I mean? So if they could make that connection between um, stewardship and the laws of obligation, there is a uh, European idea of the law of obligation. It is in law, apparently, um, Roman law. There are all these words for obligations as opposed to the straightforward civil law, you know, where you people do something wrong, they get punished for it and so on. So... So it's it's not it's not like these things are sort of foreign or they're so ancient they're way beyond modern society. A complexity of relationships is it, it's it's amazing. Um, the the big thing with relationships, relationality, and relationalism, and especially the the, the social one, the human one, um, and with land too, I guess. But um, um, this is all bound up with their people's own place that old French saying, I think, therefore I am. The Aboriginal equivalent of that is I am located, therefore I am. All meaning comes from a place, from a place. And from and from what I understand, I'm not being really critical, but it, it, it seems to me that place over, over century, over millennia for many cultures, for some cultures, but quite a lot, is that place has somehow been weaponised so a place would never be weaponized like that in Aboriginal terms. Place is a, a sacralized thing. See, that's what they, they, that's why they call land uh, country. They don't call it territory, Aboriginal people, because you can fight over territory. Um, flora and fauna can fight over territory, you know. Um, so we mustn't be like that. We're, we've sacralized it, so it has to be country, not, not territory. Some... Um, Cynics or um, real politic people <laughs> might say this is drawing a long bow, but in a sense, when you look at that map, um, what what it actually is is that autonomy is a big thing. See, autonomy, clan autonomy, but personal autonomy too, and the way of getting on is having and there's probably heaps and heaps of languages, different languages across the country of describing this term of um, um, or autonomous regard. Autonomous regard. So regard is my way of thinking. I think regard is like respect multiplied because regard is respect, but also it's something at a distance. You can really see a situation or a person, their character and that, at a distance because what you're looking at is their actions, their conduct, you know, as opposed to listening what they're actually saying and so on and so on, which could be anything. If you've heard of the term multipolarity, the old idea of unipolarity is empires, bipolarity, <laughs> sounds crazy, bipolarity, <laughs> well, it might be crazy, uh, bipolarity is two large um, um, uh, countries, um, societies fighting for hegemonic power, you know, Multipolarity is where all the countries around the world, are, they're not equal. They're not equal in size or population or economic power, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they are. They all have sovereignty in the modern Western sense of the term sovereignty and they all uh, own themselves. They have personhood. What it is, is in a sense, what you see when you look at this map is multipolarity in one country, actually. That's what... But you, you wouldn't, I don't know if there would be a, um, a word in Aboriginal languages uh, uh, for multipolarity, <laughs> but there is a word for this law of obligation, see? 
So you have to have the uh, law of obligation underpinned by this autonomous regard. And that is, in a sense, that's, that's what multipolarity, what I would imagine multipolarity is, actually. I don't know what the, um, if they have one particular definition about this, there's no, there never was, and there is now because there's a flag, <laughs> but there's no such thing as a like pan-Aboriginalism, but it, it comes through in those sort of qualities of um, um, autonomous regard, law of obligation, because wherever you go in the country, they know what you're talking about, you know, they, they all know this, and yet they accept difference between all these clan groups. The, the, the notion of stewardship, is accepted by everybody across the whole country, say, stewardship. There's probably, as I said, there's words for it, you know, different words. But the, this particular clan's um, custodianship, and it's not meant, I, I, I myself had trouble with the word myself because it's so close to um, police-like, you know, somebody held in custody, that kind, that kind of stuff. But a custodian is like a guardian also, a carer, a caretaker, and so on and so on. You know, um, so I just see that custodianship is more specific thing, whereas the stewardship is a, a cro across the country kind of idea. You know, going from the general to the specific, I suppose, in that way, because people's particular style of custodianship differs from place to place too. They're not all clones of each other. Do, do you know what I mean? That's that's what I mean. Their own their own self, their own selfhood or clanhood, if you like, you know, is um, specific. Yeah. Recently there's been, because people all over the world, especially in, um, uh, well, developed countries, I suppose, or uh, no, not not that, I mean democratic, liberal, you know, that kind of, yeah, um, is that people are beginning to sort of um, become a bit wary of um, what democracy actually means. There's so much about it. So that there is, there's starting to be a movement towards um, people's um, assemblies, citizen assemblies. How 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 can people have an impact? Ordinary people have an impact on policies and how how the country is run, because uh, it seems as wide apart as possible. Um, global economics, you can see it in. The, uh, the deliberate avoidance of anything to do with climate change, even though I know that everybody's worried about it and governments are too and they um, hold up these aims, you know, and so on. But ordinary people having a say about things, and I thought that's a really, really good development. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping and wishing that that would go further because, because it is a different system, very much a different system, the old, Aboriginal system is they they did what other cultures didn't do. Where other cultures joined power and authority, they conflated it together. If you have power, then you've got authority to do whatever you like, you know, basically declare war, all sorts of things. Um, what they did, what, Abri what the old system did was they separated power and authority, which is unheard of, you know. So, and of course, it only really works in small societies. So, um uh, so authority is with the hands of very knowledgeable people, which are principally older people. But but it could be anybody. It could be it's a com combination of a quantum of um, knowledge, a quantum of experience. But the both of them ride on conduct. The third thing. The third thing. They have to demonstrate demonstrate <laughs> that they are that that idea the condition of being worthy of what is proper. They have to actually demonstrate it. And if they can't, or if they did, never did, then you wouldn't want somebody like that um, running society. And power is always with the people, the, the bulk of the people. And of course, the old system, the the older pe the knowledgeable people are part of the general people, you know, but real power has to stay with people. You can't allow, um, uh, you know, a system where small groups of people call their states call it whatever kind of state, ancient, you know, a priestly class in Egypt with pharaohs and all that, um, you know, uh, emperors and so on, dictators, monarchies, or even the, the modern system, you know. You can't allow them to fully run things. And I, th I think people get the wrong idea that democracy does that. No, I don't think it does, actually, because everybody knows who really runs society in Western countries. 
where democracy is this great golden aura, but everybody knows who runs things really. <laughs> the rich, the powerful, do you know what I mean? Uh, and so on. Um, so that's, I was going to say, that's why I was very excited about the idea of people's assemblies or citizen assemblies 